Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation of the Kirk webinar series entitled Building Support for Waste Reduction Programs. My name is Larry Cook. I'm the Recycling Coordinator at the University of South Carolina, as well as Chair of the Kirk Board of Directors. I'll be your moderator today. For those of you not familiar with Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition is a member-based organization that works to grow collegiate recycling and waste reduction efforts by fostering technical information exchange and networking opportunities between the staff and student leaders implementing programs. Today's program is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad range of operational, educational, and other topics related to collegiate recycling and sustainable materials management. This is the first of, this is the second of six webinar programs for 2017. We'll share the schedule of upcoming webinars at the end of this program. Before we get started, I want to recognize our partners, Keep America Beautiful and AISHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, for the planning and promotional support for the overall 2017 series. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over. If you have problems with your audio or video during the webinar, you can reach a live technician by calling GoToWebinar's customer support line at 800-263-6317. To avoid background noise, we've placed all but our panelists' lines on mute. We encourage you to submit questions at any time, however, by using the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Simply click on the plus symbol where it says questions to type us a note and we will read these out loud when we get to the end of the presentations. One final note, you can find the presentation slides on the Kirk website and we'll have the recording available to stream by tomorrow. Okay, let's get started. Today's program is focused on how we earn support for recycling and other waste reduction initiatives from stakeholders at all levels of a college or university. As those of us in the field know, sustainability efforts are fundamentally about changing the way an institution operates. Managing materials sustainably benefits a college campus by increasing efficiency, lowering operational costs, and above all, by reducing its environmental footprint but it also requires an investment of time and resources to implement new practices. And on a personal level, it means asking people to change how they do their job. An effective waste reduction manager or advocate understands a crucial part of their job is to build goodwill from the president down to the department secretary and ultimately to demonstrate the value needed to earn support for recycling and other initiatives. We'll hear case study presentations from the University of Victoria in British Columbia and Johnson County Community College in Overland, Kansas, discussing the steps they took to get buy-in for various initiatives. I want to welcome our panelists for today's webinar, Nadia Arif, Dr. Jay Antle, and Michael Ray. We'll begin with the University of Victoria. Nadia Arif was born in Malaysia and raised in Ireland. She received her BA in Natural Sciences from Trinity College Dublin in 2001 and immigrated to Canada in 2002. Before joining the University of Victoria in 2009 as the Waste Reduction Coordinator, she worked for a Canadian company that built composting facilities and researched waste to energy technologies. Since joining the University of Victoria, the waste diversion rate has increased from around 55% to 69%. She has two young children and enjoys playing the ukulele. Go ahead, Nadia. Thank you very much, Larry. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. And my name is Nadia Arif, and I am the Waste Production Manager here at the University of Victoria. And I'm going to talk today about sustainability at UVic, mainly waste reduction, and how we built support for our various programs. It's important to note um, building support. As uh, you'll see, it really took layers and layers of effort and patience and time to get to where we are today. So a little bit about the University of Victoria, or UVic. We're located in British Columbia, Canada, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, and we're a destination university, mainly. Um, we're one of Canada's leading universities. We're ranked third by Maclean's, and we were widely recognized for leadership in research and community engagement. And we also have a gold rating in STARS. 
Um, some facts and figures. We're about 19,000 students and 4,500 staff and faculty. Um, the campus spans around 406 acres and has about 132 buildings. We produce about 1,800 tons of waste and recycling annually, which is about 4,000 pounds. And right now, actually, we have a 70% landfill diversion rate. 37% um, of it is composted and 33% is recycled. So sustainability at UVic. Um, sustainability is under the office of the Vice President of Finance and Operations, or the VPFO. And both the Office of Campus Planning and Sustainability and our facilities management is under the VPFO. So in 2009, UVic created the Sustainability Policy, the Sustainability Action Plan, and the Waste Reduction Unit all in one year. So it was a pretty big year for us. Um, the Sustainability Office runs all the sustainability programs on campus and is in charge of outreach and tracking the action plan progress. The action plan is, is really a document that outlines how the campus community, community can help create a sustainability campus over the next five years. There are several goals in the action plan and they're mainly related to operations. And the waste goal is to achieve 75% landfill diversion rate by 2019. So as, it, as you can see, we're almost there. Um, the waste reduction unit, of which is where I work, is an operational unit under facilities management, and we manage the collection and disposal of all waste and recycling on campus. And the unit is also involved with program integration on campus along with the sustainability office. So I'm going to chat about how to win friends and influence programs. Really, it's different for everyone, but I'll be talking about how we received buy-in for our recycling and composting programs in particular, from the top down and from the ground up, sharing strategies that worked and some things that didn't. I'll also be discussing in detail how we launched two of our main programs, um, the classroom recycling station expansion and the sorting at source office recycling station expansion. So first things first, we had to get the president and the VPFO on board. Um, the VPFO in particular is the main decision maker in terms of programming and budgets on campus. So we had to consider sort of the region and where we live. Um, British Columbia has a long history of recycling regulations and because uh, Victoria is on an island, we have a very limited landfill lifespan. There are also several landfill bans on right now, which include kitchen scraps, soil paper products, as well as various product stewardship items like electronics, refundable containers, and even packaging is banned from the landfill. So since UVic is considered a leader in the community, from this came the need to establish the sustainability policy and the action plan, and in particular to have goals around waste and waste reduction. Uh, the policy and action plan are really integral as they are the starting point and basis for all our sustainable programming on campus. We constantly refer to them, and it's a great way to align um, leadership expectation with operational goals. And I actually took this picture that we're looking right here, and this is of our Heartland landfill. Um, so it really helps me keep focus and stay the course. So one of the first things we did, even prior to having a sustainability policy or action plan, was to set up volunteer programs that we knew would be popular and that would speak to people's values. Um, to build a culture of waste reduction and initiate behavior change and just make you know, people feel good about what they're, the work that they're doing. So the first program that was set up was the Office Volunteer Compost Program, which started in 2004. Um, it really kick-started a network of volunteers from over 100 de departments and grew exponentially. Um, what we did is we provided a, a department with, who signed up with the program um, a kitchen catcher and some bio bags, and we asked them to just empty those contents into public um, compost drop-off totes. You can see a picture of one of them on the right. Um, and so, yeah, we provided the kitchen catchers and the bio bags free of charge. And it started, when it started in 2004, I think we managed to get about maybe 500 kilograms to about a ton a month, and right now we're about seven tons a month. We collect about seven tons a month, and we have 12 of these drop-off, outdoor drop-off compost totes. We've, I found that it really got people talking about waste, recycling, composting, and um, it was sort of, uh, it started organically and it really blew up, and uh, it's one of the things that people talk about the most here. 
The second program, volunteer program that was started was the Soft Plastics and Styrofoam uh, Recycling Program. This is really started by the Sustainability Office and um, departments on their own in 2007. But unfortunately, no one involved um, our custodial staff in the beginning. And so when it came to time to expand it, or even institutionalize it, there was not much buy-in at all. So even till today, it continues to be a volunteer program. So it was really a learning experience for us um, moving forward that we needed to really consult the jan janitors before we did anything. Another thing that got attention of the leadership and engaged the community was uh, waste audits. I know they're quite popular, and we did one in 2011 and 2014 with Waste Management, who is our service provider. Um, it was just a great way to confirm our landfill diversion rate and also highlight the items that we needed to target. Um, for us in particular, we found a lot of paper towels, coffee cups, food waste, and recyclable uh, food and drink containers in our waste. Um, we sampled around 20 locations on campus, and it took us a whole week to get through everything. We also collaborated with the students, um, in particular the Environmental Studies 200 lab, so we got over 100 students involved in, as part of their lab assessments to sort through various wastes. And we made sure, I made sure that they sorted through um, wastes with buildings that they had relationships with, like the Student Union building, the library, and even the building that they had their classroom in. And it really started, a, engaged a lot of conversation. Um, we publicized the audit by, um, on the last day by having it in our quad, um, see um, the tent there and signage so that we could um, be out in the public um, answering questions. And we also, the communications team also created a video which got the attention of the president and the VPFO, and the video is on YouTube if you Google UVIC Waste Audit. So we have the sustainability policy, the action plan, some volunteer programs and metrics. And next, we wanted to look at programming uh, to standardize the way that we recycle at UBIC. When I arrived in 2009, it was a little bit haphazard. So there have been two major recycling station expansion projects on campus, one involving classroom buildings and the other office buildings. So what we did is we started small and slow with little pilot programs where we picked um, buildings that had keeners, keener departments, which had their own recycling initiatives, and we involved the president's office as well in these um, pilot programs. We got budget approval for them by aligning it with the policy and the action plan, and, and also with the need to basically expand rec recycling on campus. We also had a, a little bit of bad press in 2009, uh, where a community newspaper published that UVic didn't recycle, and we really wanted to prove them wrong. Essentially, these pilot programs led to campus-wide um, expansion projects as we submitted reports and business cases to the VPFO. So the first uh, pilot program was the classroom. It were started in classrooms. So in 2009, we only had 30 of these recycling kiosks, which is the picture on the left, and then just garbage and paper recycling bins in classrooms, which is the picture on the right. And with the activation of the action plan, it was really time for a change. And so the pilot study was conducted in four classroom buildings and the student union building. And the aim, aim was to see if the amount of recycling increased if we added additional bins in the hallways and classrooms. We also wanted to see what the impact would be on janitorial services and get feedback on signage and contamination. So here you can see um, an ex example of a, a pilot study bins. We have bins sorting stations in hallways and inside the classrooms. We just redesigned our signs and we used a, a color coding system. So yeah, lots of bins. Around halfway through the study, the janitors were sort of complaining about the number of bins that they had to service. There were four bins inside classrooms and several stations in hallways. And so through their feedback, it was decided to remove the bins from the classrooms. And uh, anecdotal evidence from them was that the classrooms were actually cleaner and there were less litter. And with the additional bins in the hallways, there was actually more recycling. So um, the study was deemed a success. The treatment was expanded across campus in 2011 um, so that we removed uh, bins from all classrooms 
and we added these recycling stations in hallways, about 200 recycling stations in hallways. I'll go back. Could we go back two slides? Is that possible? I think I can do that here. So um, office buildings. In 2013, we conducted a pilot study in four office buildings. We added our three bin recycling stations in office areas and asked the janitors to service only the garbage bins, the desk side garbage bins, but not the desk side recycling bins. We asked the office occupants to empty their own recycling into the stations. So this was the pilot study. So the results were a bit confusing as people were incentivized to throw everything into their garbage because that was actually being serviced by the janitors versus the recycling, which they had to take to recycling stations. So after consultation with office staff, the surveys, and janitorial services, it was decided to add more recycling stations in office areas and suspend both the recycling and garbage desk side pickup and expand this treatment campus-wide. So here you see the expansion was done in 2016 after a very, very extensive consultation process, which I will go into detail. Um, because we involved the president's office in the pilot study, when it came to decide whether or not to suspend desk side bin service, it was kind of a no-brainer, as the VPFO said, just do it, it makes sense. So without this context, I'm not sure if would have we would have had the approval. So here in the picture, you'll see our sustainability coordinator, um, Matt Greeno, and he has those um, mini bins, the mini bin garbage bin and, the, and his recycling bin. And there's a picture of him taking it all to the recycling station. So we, before we initiated each program and expansion project, we went through an extensive consultation project with a uh, process with both janitorial staff and various staff and faculty. Um, involving janitorial staff at the ground level, as I mentioned before, is very important to get their input on various treatments and feedback on what works and doesn't. Um, we held collaborative meetings at the start of each project. We had a breakfast launch event and invited them. Um, I find that few, food is a huge incentive when it comes to getting people involved and listen to sort of your feedback and ideas. Um, we also had um, several follow-up and feedback sessions during the course of the pilot studies. And one of the reasons uh, it was great that we did this because the removal of the bins from the classrooms was actually a, an idea of one of the janitors. And one thing that we did have to learn the hard way, and I wanted to put a big slide for this, is uh, not to forget the unions and the faculty association. Um, if I was being 100% honest, they weren't en engaged as much as they should have. Uh, we engaged them throughout the pilot program process, but we failed to follow up during the rollout and expansion projects. And this is because uh, we had assumptions, but presidents change and reps change. So it's just not a good idea to assume that you have the unions and the faculty association on board. Um, at, for our office expansion project, we didn't really um, consult with the unions or faculty association until the, in the middle or to the near end of the project, and it almost stopped the whole process. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to highlight that fact to not forget them. So we, of course, involved a lot of faculty and staff in our consultation process. Um, we had a post-pilot study consultation lunch with faculty and staff across campus. So we had this lunch to help learn what, what worked and what didn't, and also to hear their concerns. But mostly people just wanted to talk about composting and not the fact that there were no more bins in classrooms. No one seemed to care. Um, we also invited admin staff to coffee consultation meetings where we asked for, and we asked for their involvement in uh, where to put bins during the office expansion. Um, we sent out surveys to faculty and staff asking for their feedback as well. Uh, we, I found surveys were a good anonymous way to hear back from study participants, but we also found two extremes. People were actually very passionate either for or against the various treatments. So it kind of skewed everything, but luckily for us in the office study, there, were a lot, there was a 
um, a lot of conversation about the death side bin service suspension, and the majority of people were for it. Um, what's actually quite missing from here is uh, what was challenging so much is trying to involve students um, in, in this programming. We found timing to actually be imperative when it came to students, so we introduced new programs always at the beginning of the term versus in the middle of the term. And before each treatment was expanded campus-wide, we published FAQs on websites and in memos, um, especially if there was a high impact to a particular user group. So of course, one thing that worked to, to get buy-in was to measure and uh, report our successes. So we weighed the amount of recycling coming out of the pilot study buildings and compared it to pre-pilot study numbers. We were able to quantify the successes in, the, in our reports, and these reports were submitted to the VPA, VPFO as a business plan for the project expansion. So in the classroom pilot study, an additional one ton of material was recycled, and in the office pilot study, an, an addition of 200 kilograms of material was recycled. Um, in our report, we also reported the anecdotal successes, um, example, the less waste in the classroom, and the survey results. Um, again, though, um, everyone kept asking about composting and when that was going to happen. Uh, another way we reported our successes was uh, we tried to gain momentum and get a lot of articles in our, our campus newspaper, which is called The Ring. Um, we had about four or five articles in the picture. Here are the pictures you can see them. Um, in the articles, we also got um, our VTFO involved in the pictures. So she's the lady in the bottom right. Um, and yeah, we wanted to just shout it from the rooftops. And the other thing that we found that was um, really important, especially when you want to get budget approval, is to have accurate numbers and to operational impact. Um, really have that business case down pat um, because um, you don't want egg on your face after that or, or to ask more, for more money after the fact. Um, the other thing that we uh, found that was really helpful was to be really honest and transparent about our, um, about our time in reporting. For example, there was a lot of discussion regarding janitorial services and the time that was saved from them not servicing classroom buildings and not having to service bins um, um, at desks. Um, so we had really open discussions with our community here, and we did some metrics, and the janitorial services said that really there was no time saved, it was just net neutral, um, and that any time saved was to be reabsorbed into existing, um, existing jobs. And basically people were just worried and wanted to make sure that we weren't going to lose any um, any any jobs from saving time. So we had to be very upfront with this um, in the beginning. And really the one of the main things is this we took our time. We took time rolling out these programs. As you can see, it took years. Um, the classroom pilot study started in 2009 and we rolled out in 2011. And the office pilot study started in 2013 and we only rolled it out in 2016. Um, change is hard, and so a consultation process is very important, um, especially with staff and unions. And um, I have to note that I haven't heard a peep from students. They're, they're pretty much ab have absorbed all the new programming, no problem. So the future, what's next? So I just got approval to add a fourth bin to our recycling station, um, a compost bin, which is uh, very exciting. And finally, I think after all this, I can start focusing on reduction and reuse programs because I think we've got our recycling and composting down pat. Um, I also wanted to mention very briefly as a side that uh, we have a sustainability staff network here. And an interesting thing that they did is they created an incentive whereby people could call in and submit sort of office-specific tips on how to reduce energy or reduce waste. And then um, by doing so, they would enter a draw to win a gift certificate. 
So, for example, a janitor called in and said, oh, there's a lunchroom that, whose light is always on or a hallway light that is always on and it's never turned off. So then it was decided to put it on a time sensor. And, you know, he entered a draw and he actually won a $100 gift certificate. It's just, you know, these are, again, small incentives that we find that kind of really build support sort of campus-wide. Um, yeah, and so that's it. That's my time. I just wanted to thank you uh, to the team at Kirk and Keep America Beautiful and Ashley for giving me this opportunity to share our story. Thanks so much, Nadia. Um, we'll take a few questions from the audience in a minute. Uh, so if you have something to ask Nadia, please click on the plus sign next to the word question um, on the GoToWebinar dashboard to type in your question. But first, we do have a polling question for the audience. If you can rate the level of administration support you have at your institution for waste reduction efforts, so strong, uh, supportive of expanding collection policies, et cetera, good, mostly open to expanding efforts, okay, accepting of efforts um, that don't require resources or weak and different resistant to new efforts. So take a minute to uh, submit your answer to that question. Um, and before we get to those results, uh, let's do, Nadia, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the specifics of your pilot programs. Um, you mentioned, I think, that you had about 150 buildings on campus and the, that um, for the classroom project you added 200 stations. Can you talk about how many buildings those were in um, a little bit? Yeah, um, almost all of our buildings have a classroom component. So I think uh, out of those 132 buildings, there are about 100 buildings on campus that we added those 200 stations on. And we only did it in the classroom areas to start with. So no office areas at all had recycling stations. So yeah, we kind of did it in two phases. And then we um, expanded it completely campus-wide with the office building um, project and we um, put stations in those other 32 buildings and as well as in all hallways basically on campus. So right now we have 400 of those three bin recycling stations on campus and they're all about to get a green bin in the next two months. So yeah, that's great. Great. We went um, from those 30 kiosks, those 30 kiosks to 400 stations. That's that's great. Um, let's see if we've got the result of our polling question to display. Um, there we go. Uh, so it looks like most of the participants are kind of in the middle. Um, some level of support, um, almost 20% though, with with very supportive administrations, and uh, less than 10% with. Um, the resistance to to making improvements in the program. That's that's great news. Let's do a couple more questions for for Nadia. Um, so you mentioned that getting accurate data uh, is one of the best ways to or best arguments to present to the administration to convince them. Um, and you mentioned waste audits, but can you talk a little bit more about how you got that, both um, measuring the improvements, uh, is that something that waste management assisted with you, you with, um, what kind of the averages or, or um, extrapolations you had to use, and then kind of along those lines, um, have you looked into contamination rates since improving the access in, in your campus? Yeah, we have. So what we did is um, my unit, we set up bins in all the like uh, separate bins in our pilot study areas that we asked the janitors to sort of empty all the waste recycling from those buildings in our pilot studies into those bins. And then we weighed them. So we did that pre-pilot study and post-pilot study so that we could get a comparison basically of um, the effect of the additional bins. So that's how we um, measured and got those numbers where it was one ton of additional recyclable material in the classroom pilot study and 200 kilograms in the office pilot study. And we found what was interesting with the office pilot study, we were wondering why those numbers were so low and it's because people were taking stuff back for, because a lot of it was refundable containers and people were taking that um, stuff back 
for their own charity organization. It was like a really, uh, like a cat lady who just collected containers from one whole building, which happened to be our pilot study. So it skewed, it skewed it a little bit, but not too much. And in terms of the contamination rate, um, so what I did is I, I walked through and did sort of a random um, viewing of all the bins to kind of assess visually um, what the contamination rate was like. And we also sort of chatted to um, the janitors to see like, okay, what's the contamination rate? Um, rate like how are you finding the containers bin? How are you finding the paper bin? And what we found out is that paper was pretty much 99% clean, but the refundable bin, uh, the containers bin, um, was often contaminated with either food or soiled paper products. So we had to do a lot of messaging around that, which is why we uh, we had basically four versions of our signage and, uh, and of our bins to try and clear up that contamination rate. And have you seen success in working on contamination or is that just something that you're continuing to work on? Yeah, it's something that we continue to work on. Unfortunately, um, we, our stations work good, but the main contamination is just like, for example, coffee, like liquids just being in our container stream um, and also soft plastics. So I'm hoping when we eventually expand the soft plastics and styrofoam recycling that there will be less contamination in the containers then. But I think it's just something that we have to live with. And I know that our recycling facility has, has basically absorbed about a 10 to 12% contamination rate, I would say, in our recycling stream. And it's just something that they sort of handle operationally. Okay, um, let's let's do one more question now, and then we'll move on to our next presenters, uh, and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, the compost expansion and also the the volunteer compost project, um, yeah. and uh, specifically about pest issues like fruit flies, um, how you're dealing with that, and then. When you transition to the campus-wide program, will the volunteer program go away, or will it still stay there? So yeah, we we've had a lot of issues with fruit flies in the past, and usually in the summer, people sort of abandon their compost volunteer program, or abandon at least having bins inside the building. And you know, I've tried to give support with sort of um, recommendations to try and service it daily, or, or somebody said that that if they um, Food fly tape fans. So if you had a desk fan to direct it at the kitchen catcher at the bin, and there'll be no more fruit flies. I even had somebody say, let's get a, a Venus fly trap and set it next, like a little plant, and set, set it next to the kitchen catcher. So, I mean, yeah, no, there were lots of conversation, but essentially, no real solution. But in terms of our expansion, how we, um, how we are actually having a contract to come in and service those green bins. And he, they have um, promised that they would service it daily. So that's what we think, how we think we're going to combat it is with a daily service, but understanding that we're probably going to have some challenges on the way. And so that's why I'm hoping to get all the bins out this summer so that we can see, can deal with those challenges head on. Um, and try and figure out solutions, whether it be servicing or lids or filters or who knows. Okay. Um, thanks again so much, Nadia. We'll have some more questions for you at the end. Um, but now we're going to move on to um, Jay and Michael. Dr. Jay Antle earned an undergraduate degree from Lee College and a master's from Arizona State University before completing his PhD in American Environmental History at the University of Kansas in 1992. While in graduate school, he participated in an exchange program with Johnson County Community College that ultimately led him to secure a professorship there in 2000 that he still holds. His responsibilities at JCCC have grown to include heading up the college's sustainability program as the executive director of the college's sustainability center. Michael Ray has been working with Johnson County Community College for the last 13 years, six years in his role as the college's sustainability project manager. 
Michael manages the college's waste reduction and energy efficiency projects, as well as other sustainability-related programs associated with the college. Welcome, Jay and Michael. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for having us. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I'm Jay Antle, um, and I'll make a few introductory comments, and then Michael will talk about uh, the bulk of the details. I'll chime in from time to time about particularly stakeholder engagement, and then at the end of our case studies, um, I will spend some time talking about some overarching strategies which actually uh, go across individual project lines. So we've been at work on these issues here at Johnson County Community College really in some ways since 2008, 2009. And uh, as Michael will attest, we've, we've come a long way. I'll show you some metrics a bit later on. Uh, but I think it's really important for me to give some credit to some other people who, uh, who are, aren't necessarily on our webinar today. Uh, for example, our current waste reduction manager is uh, Crystal Antone, and we have a number of student interns who have made a lot of what we do possible. And we'll return to this point time and time again, but student engagement, uh, student advocacy on behalf of your programs, uh, these are all essential components to getting uh, these kinds of programs established and uh, embraced by people who might otherwise be skeptical. Uh, you know, one thing about where we are, I should point out to you, is we're in Overland Park, Kansas, which is in the southwestern corner of the Kansas City metropolitan area. And uh, Kansas is known for being uh, conservative on a number of issues. In fact, uh, it wasn't too many years ago there was a bill introduced in the Kansas legislature which would have made positions like mine uh, illegal in terms of using campus funds. Uh, now those bills didn't go anywhere, but I do want to point that out just as some context to, to tell you that we're working in an environment which is not one which is necessarily easy. And so some of our strategies are thus tailored accordingly. So with that, I'll turn some of the, uh, the slides over to Michael Ray and then I'll chime in time to time throughout. All right, hello, my name is Michael Ray. I am uh, the project manager here and kind of wanted to start off with giving you an understanding of what our campus looks like. So from a perspective of people, we have 17,000 students, uh, about 2,500 employees. We've had uh, a remarkable amount of students go through sustainability enhanced courses since uh, 2012 when we started one of our programs that really integrated sustainability into coursework. Um, the other things we do on campus is a lot of tours, so we do about 300 community members per year. I want to tell you a little bit about our campus in general as it relates to the size. So we were established in 1972. As you can see up in that map on top, Kansas is, uh, or Overland Park is right next to Kansas City. We have 23 buildings on campus, almost 2, 2 million square foot. 245 acres, and from a statistical standpoint for our sustainability program, we have a two and a half acre sustainable ag farm, which is down here in the corner. And we also have been working towards a lot of solar PV. We have 237 KW right now. So we do have operational goals that, that align with uh, some of our programs, one of which was the 50% landfill diversion by 2016, which we reached this uh, last year. And we also have a zero waste to landfill goal by 2025. Uh, in addition to that, some of our other operational goals are a 15% renewable energy campus by 2020, which we may get close to, and then 100% renewable to, by 2050. And you know, one thing about these goals you see here, Evidence of our success with stakeholders is that uh, those bottom three goals are now part of the campus-wide master plan, which was approved by our board of trustees uh, earlier this year. And that is evidence, along with some of the programs that we're going to talk about a little bit later on, of how we managed to uh, gain credibility with decision makers here on campus. And uh, just to give you a reference, that green wall behind this, uh, this slide is a green wall from our LEED Platinum building. And that was the second LEED Platinum building in Kansas. Second or third. Yeah. So we're very proud of that. So where are we today? Um, some of the savings and revenue that we've had based on our recycling program is a landfill cost voided of almost $140,000. All of our 
recycling dollars goes towards scholarship monies, and so we've created about $158,000 to date um, that goes to student scholarships, which is, has been great. I wanted to give you an idea of what our recycling background or our breakdown looks like. We have about 58% of it being single stream, and then the next piece of it being paper and cardboard. Uh, the rest uh, can be filled in, but compost also makes a big piece of that as well as we compost on site. Um, you can see the graphs below, I won't get into detail on those, but basically, as you can see in 2010, we were doing a lot of trash, and now we're about 50-50 with that, uh, so that's good. Uh, the other thing I like to see is, is, because we do track a lot of metrics, is the, uh, the trash costs that we have to pay are almost going to be equaling the amount of recycling revenue, so once those even out, that's going to be a pretty impressive number to uh, deliver to upper administration. And, and as Michael will, will go through this presentation, you'll see that we have a lot of data, we have a lot of charts and graphs, and we have these publicly available on our website, so not only can we use them in presentations uh, to members of the public, but we can do it to a decision maker. We just pull up our website and there's our data. So we try to be as transparent as possible with our data and as precise as possible with our data, and that helps build credibility. And uh, the fact that it's transparently available uh, to anyone who wants to look at it, builds further credibility uh, with decision makers. So I wanted to just kind of give you three case studies with metrics, one of which is going to be data collection, which is the tracking trash and recycling that really justified the change uh, to, to some of the things in the programs that we were able to implement. I want to talk about policy change a little bit. Um, we did some policy change that changed the way we sur managed our surplus. And then I lastly just kind of wanted to give you our newest uh, update on a pro program that we put together, which is a waste audit, uh, that, that we had one intention of the waste audit to produce information for us, but in the end it actually gave us a whole new program, and I'll talk about that last. So uh, the first one is data collection and tracking trash for recycling. Uh, what we've done since the beginning, when I began here in 2010, was to create a database of our trash bills and our recycling rebates. It's a massive database at this point that has basically been tracking seven years of trash and recycling. Um, some of the things that we had to analyze was, what do we have? Uh, we noticed that we've got uh, a lot of low volume in trash compactors. And so what we also then noticed was by analyzing a lot of that data that uh, we were doing weekly pickups. So having all these dates and all these weights uh, put into this database gave me the capability of actually tracking and seeing what was going on. So we asked people why. Why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing a weekly pickup? And, and why is the volume so low? Well, one of the first answers we got was the smell. And the other one is the that very long acronym, which is we've always done it that way, basically. And it's easy. It's easy to have something done where no one has to make a phone call to the, the trash hauler and have them come pick it up. So we asked the question, what would happen if we removed that food? Um, could you wait for the warning light to go on at that point? And uh, so we had those conversations with our housekeeping. And, and, and it was a long process. It wasn't a one-day process, but we certainly met with them a few times to sort of hash out what that might look like. So who are the stakeholders and who were the decision holders, uh, decision makers that we had to pull forward? Our stakeholders were our housekeeping, our grounds, uh, they also add to the trash, and then our trash hauler so that they would understand our process and why we were going to switch from, from uh, the scheduled program to actually calling in a pickup of a compactor. So this is our compactor down here at the bottom, and that's the one that we made the big change on. Um, we also involved our sustainability sustainability team, obviously. So can we make this change without negatively impacting operations, i.e. the smell issue? Um, well, that was a matter of piloting it. So what we did was we, we started the composting program. We had funds to get an in composter, and we moved forward. Um, we did a, a few audits in order to see how much food waste was going in and being removed. We found that we are basically pulling out 400 pounds of food per day. So that really reduced the amount of weight but also the amount of smell that was going to go into this compactor. There was a lot of 
training of staff that needed to be done based on the procedures that were going to happen. Um, that would be within our dining services operation because that's where most of our compost comes from. It's a it's a pre-consumer compost, so a lot of that was easily managed just through training of the dining services staff, and then also training and housekeeping as to why we were doing this uh, program, and then why they could wait to have the bins pulled by the trash hauler. So uh, in the end, the authority on this was really the director of housekeeping that uh, bought in on it and we moved forward with it. So I want to give you sort of the context of what happened. Um, we tried it out and then basically the next year, because we kept all the data, we were able to show that we had a $25,000 reduction in our trash hauling. And that's sort of highlighted here. So one year we, we were in the 50000 and the next year we were in the $25,000 uh, for that particular trash hauling. Um, so again, as it was mentioned before, we, we do this because we want to build credibility with stakeholders also because it develops uh, a new and, and adaptive program that we could move forward to other areas on campus. So. Uh, in that light, we, we saved on that particular compactor, and then that gave us the idea, well, then why would we do that with, not with every other program on or every compactor on campus? So all compactors on campus were then removed from the uh, weekly pickup. And that's where the bulk of that savings came from. Correct. So that's where we made um, that $25,000 in savings. So what did data collection get us in terms of uh, something that was tangible for sustainability as, as, as a department that was just looking at data. And so that gave us this larger composting program. And so now we're able to basically have, in any given time, about four to five students, uh, interns, the ability to run our entire composting program. And we have a, just for those who are uh, nerdy on composting, <laughs> we have a BW Organic in vessel composter, and again, we process about 400 pounds of food waste per day, which is about 40 tons per year. And by the way, uh, those interns there are wearing our, our branded uh, dirt, uh, dirt Brewer shirts, and uh, so when people see those interns wearing those around campus, they know they're part of the composting and slash sustainability program. So the next uh, piece I wanted to kind of talk about was policy change. Um, we had a discovery mode, so our policy change was going to be based around our surplus operation. We had a we had an operation that basically had an annual auction, where they would take everything out of the warehouse and they would try and sell it in one day. Okay, let's stop for a second. Imagine that everybody at your institutions, your surplus property auction, because of the way that your board policy worked, happened at a public auction on one day, so everything is held in your warehouse. For that one day when it might rain. And it actually did for the two of the years that I was a part of this, it actually rained. So uh, part of that rain contributed to the problem of that's, well, it's all ruined, so now we got to throw it away because we can't actually give it away. So that, that's part of that discovery mode. We studied what happened to the surplus, and we had low attendance at these annual auctions, and then at the end, the rest of it was just thrown into a trash can. Um, some of the reason was, was because we discovered that the uh, the rain destroyed it. But on the other hand, we did have particular people or nonprofits that were willing to come pick it up. But we had one bad experience with one of them. They didn't show up. And then after that, I think it just became, well, we don't want to do this anymore. We don't want to call them. They never showed up. So we're just going to throw it all away. And uh, we, we worked on that hard to alleviate that issue as well. Um, again, collected data. Uh, this seems to be a recurring thing for all of these things that we continue to do. And then we looked at the revenue from the auction. So we were able to say, okay, we're making $17,000 on a one-time auction per year. What's the time and effort spent as well? And how much of that uh, is being thrown away? So we track all that. We analyzed how much was there, where it's going, and what its value is. So the next thing we did was we changed the way that surplus is managed. We wanted to find what opportunities you could, could, create, could create to create a better avenue for sustainability in terms of 
many different things, one of which was just the, the fact that we have space constraints, as Jay was alluding to. Um, we could increase our revenue, we could add jobs, and we'd need a change of policy. So one of the things we had to do was create partnerships, or at least make friends. I think that was mentioned in the, uh, the last presentation. You got to get people on board, you got to get people understanding why it's a better option to uh, change the policy so that the policy allows you to get rid of these items in not just a different way, but in multiple ways. So we looked at different avenues for disposition of the property. Um, just want to give you one quick story. The reason this picture is here, these pole vaulting mats, is because these went into a dumpster and we were going to have to pay about $200 to $250 just to haul these off. Um, I suggested, well, let's try and sell them on GovDeals. And so by that right, we ended up making $700 on GovDeals for somebody to come pick them up, and then we didn't have to pay the $200 to get rid of them. And they're being reused. Yeah, uh, especially considering they're you know, foam, so it's not the funnest thing to try and get into the landfill. So we worked with a lot of different folks to get uh, a rewrite of our policy. We collaborated with our warehouse folks, um, our procurement folks, and, and most importantly, we got a lot of help from our legal department. Correct. They were crucial in getting us to get it rewritten properly that the board would want us to move forward with it and to make sure that we had a lot of flexibility as well. So we updated our policy number 215.07. Um, and if you want to go see what that policy is, there's a link at the bottom of this. And then I'm sure Kirk could provide that link as well uh, as a follow-up. One of the things we had to do too is define what a hierarchy of best use was, trash being last. Um, as you can see on the side, I probably don't need to read that, but in, in, in Internal reuse was really important to us because we want to make sure that if somebody needed furniture, they could go there and get it. So, um, additionally, what we had to do was write a procedures document for this whole process too, and that gave us the capability of uh, everyone sort of knowing what needs to happen, and, and so that's a whole different document, but it's also under that link. And what I would like to suggest here is not that we as the sustainability office is trying to take credit for this particular change and happening solely. But we, along with other people on campus, recognized that our surplus property policy had lots of issues. And so then we became conveners and participants in a conversation and bringing all these folks together. And, uh, and so lots of people had input and we ultimately came up with a set of policies that uh, had done very well for the college. Yeah. One thing I would like to note about the hierarchy is that when you build that hierarchy, don't put a one, two, three, four, and five, and that's the list. You, it needs to be somewhat flexible because you're not always going to have the capability of going down that line perfectly. You may need to just skip right to recycling. We kind of had to create the language within the policy that allowed us to do that. So that was that was very helpful, and that was another one of those key things that the legal department was able to help us with. Yeah, well, the, well legal, you know, what our philosophy was to have our board policy statements very broad and to take some of those sticky details that had required that auction, for example, an annual auction, and put those into procedures documents that are more internal uh, rather than being true board policies. So we did implement the change and we actually teamed up with GovDeals.com for online auctioning. Um, I say here we have two tiers. We have a tier one, which is which is interesting because GovDeals allows you to put in a, a pre-viewable website that your employees can go look at ahead of time to see if it's something they need prior to it going out to public. And that's been very helpful. It allows us to kind of preview what might be out there for about 90 days. Um, and then after that, it goes on to our website for GovDeals.com and you can see what you want to buy. And to be clear what Michael's talking about there is that tier one is for people internally at the college to see if they want to request something from the warehouse for reuse before it goes to tier two, which is that public viewing and uh, public sale. Yeah. Um, we measured all of the results off this and as you can see in my note there, we increased revenue considerably. Um, in the three years that prior, that we had taken some data, we were making about $15,000 per year at each, au at each auction. So basically in the last three years now, we've made $174,000.
So it's been a great program, and you know some of the things we'd like to move forward with would be, okay, now that we've made $43,000 per year, that's potential salary for someone who could increase the amount of revenue based on marketing or other things. So we're always thinking of new ideas, and you know, hopefully in the future we could create an internship um, or some other type of program that would allow for better marketing of materials. So. And as uh, the slide suggests, these conversations that we had with procurement and our warehouse staff have built credibility for us then uh, to increase things that go straight to donate, donation to nonprofits or recycling for revenue or we're just recycling, period. So, uh, again, the credibility of creating a process and being seen as an honest broker allows us to have conversations that promote sustainability more broadly beyond just more revenue to the college. Mm -hmm. Another nuts and bolts piece of this is just creating multiple avenues for your donation and your recycling vendors. You really need to call, 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 find out who can take this, and then develop a list. That's been very helpful in not just having one donation location because they can fail or they, or, you know, they can drop off the, the face of the earth sometimes, and you're just like, okay, well, now what do I do? So having a lot of different avenues is very important. So the, the last one I want to talk about is a waste audit to create opportunities. We created a waste audit back in November uh, to basically find out how much of our recycling was getting put into the trash. Uh, that was our main goal at first, and then that turned into something else. So um, what we did was they separated everything out, and they found that there was certainly a certain amount of recycling being thrown in the trash. And those issues were uh, uh, resolved or not resolved, it's certainly addressed. And in addition to that, what we found was that paper towel was a big issue. And we wanted to come up with a program that would allow us to do a team effort between our housekeeping and our sustainability staff or interns to capture a lot of that paper towel waste. Um, so what we did was we pulled together some stakeholders and decision makers, those being the sustainability and the housekeeping uh, staff. And we had some long conversations about how can we effectively do this. So we've started a pilot project in two of our uh, buildings, and that does basically, if this proves uh, to be effective, then we can move forward and increase the longevity of these things. So where will these paper towels go? One of the things we've decided is we don't necessarily have on-site capability of handling this type of a waste. So we've worked with an outside vendor that does uh, organics recycling in town, and then they're very excited to, to, to join in this program with us. So this is sort of the waste audit that we did. I kind of wanted to give you this, I probably should have given this uh, graph up front, but basically it shows that our paper towels were 14% um, of the weight that we were finding. So that's a, a significant amount, and that's why we had no intention of this ahead of time, but just because we did a waste audit, we came up with this whole program, and that gave us the idea that, you know, this is something substantial, this is something we can do. Um, the other things that we found were obviously the compostable food waste uh, that we'll be able to attack later here in the year as well. So I'll uh, turn it over to Jay, and he'll kind of talk about how higher-ups in the uh, administration can help us. Right. So a lot of these initiatives, uh, Michael talked about specific conversations, but there's sort of a larger context here that I think is important for us to talk about, at least as to how we've managed to have some success here at Johnson County Community College. Um, I provide regular updates to um, the executive team here at the college, the vice presidents and above, with regular meetings. And I also have occasional meetings individually with, with the Board of Trustees, and I'm also a frequent uh, attendee at our uh, board meetings and our board committee meetings, so that uh, I become sort of the go-to resource uh, for questions about resource use on campus. And I'm able to answer their questions if they have questions about what we do or the metrics involved, because we keep those metrics and we track them. And so over the years, then, that has built credibility for what we do here on the campus. Uh, we've also involved students in very high-profile ways here at Johnson County Community College, and of course the students themselves 
have a substantial say in as to what we end up doing. For example, the students here at JCCC uh, on their own asked for the creation of a student uh, sustainability fund, a green fee, a few years back, and uh, that fund allows us to have a great deal of flexibility in terms of how we invest in these kinds of programs like we're discussing today. Those students uh, help dispense those dollars uh, through the Student Sustainability Committee, and we've also talked about how students uh, do a lot of this work uh, through internships, and we've had students uh, leave here to go on and get careers in the waste management field, including I think at least one individual who I believe is on the webinar today listening. Hi, Eric. Uh, let's see. Uh, students are also involved in terms of that coursework. We talked about our Sunflower Project where we have over 27,000 students who've been involved in sustainability-infused curriculum here on the campus, and that includes those waste audits. And so students uh, are trying to use, are using our campus as a learning lab in terms of some of these, these programs, and we have uh, students who are more than willing to provide testimonials as to how this makes them feel proud of the campus that they're attending. And uh, I think as higher education becomes more competitive, I think those advantages matter uh, to folks, say, for example, in student services who are trying to attract students to campuses. This next piece is very important. Um, here at, our, at Johnson County Community College, we uh, in the Sustainability Office have been very engaged in promoting energy efficiency on campus in partnership with campus services, our facilities area. And we've had a great deal of success in investing in energy efficiency and uh, giving presentations about the uh, efficacy of those programs to the point now where we're able to claim, not just claim, we're able to prove almost $3 million in avoided costs by the energy work that we've done. So it builds credibility synergistically that these are the things that sustainability, quote unquote, folks are involved in, and so far it has worked, so we'll go with them on what they want to do next. And I think that's partially, uh, partially explains why we've been able to get those goals into the facilities master plan. And so now they've become talking points for our, uh, for our president and for members of our administration, the zero waste by 2025 those goals and those uh, those benchmark dates are now becoming things that our executive team talk about without me having to be in the room. So this all, this credibility builds synergistically and it goes across sustainability initiatives. I mentioned the, uh, the green fee there. Uh, awards matter too. Uh, apply for them. Get them. Groups like Kirk need to give more of them. Uh, groups like Asia need to give more of them. And of course they need to be ballot awards with meaningful criteria, but awards matter to leadership uh, at institutions of higher education. Um, it gives them talking points, it's, uh, it's validation of effort, and I think those things uh, do matter a great deal, and perhaps, the, and I think they, they matter more than sometimes those of us working in the trenches get them credit for. And then finally, uh, data, 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 provide it, don't wait to be asked for it, provide it proactively. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I've had conversations with administrators and one of the first things they say to me is, you know what I like about what you guys do is you have the numbers before we have to ask for them. And then I tend to get a story about area X, or Y, or Z who didn't have the data even after they were asked for it. So uh, that, that helps build credibility. And um, those are just some of the strategies here in the context that the programs that Michael helped create and then Crystal and our interns are continuing to, continuing to carry forward. Um, that's how all this happened. So I think, I think we are done. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Jay and Michael. That was um, really incredibly informative. Um, we're going to have some questions for you in a second, but let's throw up our second polling question. Um, it is, what do you find most influential uh, to build administration support for waste reduction projects? And the choices are rating, certifications, commitments, stars, etc., document um, financial benefits, uh, documenting reduced waste environmental impacts, benefits to school reputation, or student stakeholder advocacy. So while we wait for you to submit those responses, I've got a, a question that I want to ask to both uh, teams of presenters, um, and we'll, we'll start with you first, Jay and Michael, but uh, 
both presentations talked a lot about the importance of getting um, you know these initiatives published in policies or in master plans that sort of thing which which is a can be a challenge in and of itself but can you talk a little bit more and, and both of you touched on this a little bit already but on the accountability of that so um, for example your zero waste goal by 2025 um, Jay you mentioned that uh, it's great that that gets brought up in a room even if you're not there but um, what other kind of levels of accountability uh, is there once you know it's supposedly something like this is on the institution's radar? That's a great question and to be honest I think we're going to find out uh, but generally when you reprogram the language of the institution by which the institution runs uh, then suddenly these things become everyone's responsibility and not just yours and of course how that plays out is different at each institution um, but when you start getting these things into your accreditation reviews, when you start getting these things into your master plan, so these master plans, when these things become you know values in your campus strategic plan, then suddenly everyone points to that and says these are the things that we have to do. Now what we'll find out over the course of the next few years is is who gets pointed at in terms of who is responsible for these particular items. I can say the fact that these things are in the plan here at Johnson County Community College now mean that many more people are talking about them than would have happened previously. And so that to me is a great sign and I think there will be some, there will be spread accountability. But to be clear, we haven't had that play out specifically yet. Yeah, and I would add too that if, if you're going to do this, you have to keep in mind since we are in higher ed, it's going to take time. So. You, you don't you don't want to expect it like I did when I first started to happen in the first year. Uh, so you know, understanding that the more you say it, the more everyone else starts to say it. Great. And Nadia, do you have any comments on account long term accountability uh, for for these planning documents? Um, no, I think everybody sort of said what I was going to say as well. It's just, it's important to have them in place. Great. Um, let's check back on our polling question and see uh, how the results have come in. Okay, so it looks like almost half of us um, think that the most uh, influential argument is documenting the financial benefits, and, and that goes back to the, the stress on, on data that, that both our presentations included. Um, can, I, can I undermine my own point now? Sure. Okay, so we are at the place now at our institution where we've done so much of that financial benefit piece. Um, that combined with lots of student advocacy, I can now make the argument and about half the folks I talk to embrace it, not everyone does, that these are also the right things to be doing. And uh, different co campus cultures will embrace that set of ideas, that ethical set of ideas earlier. But oddly enough, actually oddly enough, I think here the fact that we were able to document the benefits first allows that second argument to be um, more easily made. The ethical argument is easier to make, particularly when it's being backed up by student demand. Just a thought. Yeah, well, that, that's that's a great point. Um, if if we kind of reflect back on the results of the first polling question and, and uh, the levels of um, administrative support, I think that what's most influential will probably evolve over time depending on the stage your program is in, whether it, that's um, stage of existence or uh, development or level of support. I think um, <laughs> going back to one of your other points, Jay, about awards and, and things, often I think we in this field, uh, like you were saying, discount the importance of that and think um, we're so involved in the day-to-day -day, we don't even have time to apply for those sorts of things. But, um, you know, it may be that after you get the buy-in with some financial benefits, then you have the flexibility to move on to some other things. Um, that's another thing that Nadia mentioned. Uh, that now that their program has developed in being pretty good about accessibility, um, she has the flexibility and time to move on to 
um, really educating about source reduction and, and, and tackling that issue. Um, not that those things have to happen separately, but often just because of restrictions on our time, they end up right. happening separately. So um, how about another question for, for you, Jay and, and Michael, about your compactors. Um, do you, does the institution own those or are those provided by your hauler? And the kind of the follow-up to that is, um, do you feel like uh, diverting the food waste out of there is going to give longer life to those compactors? Question. Yeah, we own our own, and so I would agree with that that fact that we've we've pulled some compactors during waste audit, and they are full of uck and water and and things that are going to corrode it. So, yes, I do think that that's certainly a benefit that I have never thought of actually moving forward to procurement or even housekeeping to say, hey, we're uh, increasing longevity of these particular pieces of equipment. Okay. Uh, let's move over back to you, Nadia, and uh, we had a question about the structure of your de department. Um, can you expand a little bit on organizational structure, what your office does, what where the cust custodial department is headquartered, and how you kind of managed staff um, in as you were distributing the new containers and then how they're serviced now that they're in place? Sure. So there's the <clears throat> Office of the Vice President of Finance and Operations, and under that is Facilities Management and the Office of uh, Campus Planning and Sustainability. So Facilities Management is all sort of the ground, the carpenter, mechanical, plumbing, electrical shops, uh, project officers, and waste reduction, um, and janitorial services. So we're all under facilities management. And I'm lucky in that my direct boss, my director, is also the boss of janitorial services. So we work closely together, absolutely, during these program integrations and at the beginning stages. And I use my staff to basically build the bins, sign the bins, and deploy them on staff, and then the janitors service them. Is that... Yeah, I, th I think that's that's great. Um, Jay and Michael, can you answer a similar question, just kind of organizationally, how, how you're structured and, and where you fall? Yeah, it's changed over time. When we were first created, we actually had a direct reporting line uh, to the president of the college, and then we had a president of succession, and uh, we were placed in, uh, in facilities and campus services um, where, we, where we currently reside. Which, being a faculty member, is an, is uh, an interesting ex experience, but I think it's worked really well in terms of overall partnerships. Um, so that's where we are. That's also where, of course, uh, housekeeping and and uh, other folks are, and where all the energy work actually takes place. So part of my challenge as an academic is to uh, is to make sure that that change of reporting line did not impact our work on the academic side, and thankfully, it really hasn't at all. Michael, you want to add to that? No, I think that kind of hit on the nail. I mean, we. We do have a lot more integration with campus services now because we're under them. So from my side, when it comes to operations, some of that stuff is a little easier to have, at least have conversations yeah. with. Great. Um, and I'm going to do another question that's kind of for, for both of you, and we'll start with uh, Jay and Michael again. Um, let's talk about bags a little bit. So it looked like... Um, most of your bins are lined with bags, including it looked like the paper towel bins. Um, can you talk a little bit about if the material is collected in bags, does it get delivered to the recycle center in the bags? Or, and, and um, for composting, are you using compostable bags or are those having to be emptied? Is that done on campus? That sort of thing. Sure. Um, for our bags and recycling, we use blue bags. Uh, it took a while to get that. Um, going, but we finally get to that point, and so those are delivered directly, so that's why I wanted to mention, too, that we're a, we're mostly a single-stream campus when it comes to the, you know, sort of the hallway and the classroom type of recycled materials. Um, the composting effort, yes, we do use uh, compostable bags, um, and we are now piloting with compostable bags in the restrooms. But uh, our waste audit did suggest, and this may be where this question was, and it's, inspired by that um, 
we have a lot of uh, bags that come out of bins and uh, cans around campus that are not even close to being full. And so at the end of the day, that's an issue that we're going to, we're not quite sure what we're going to do with. <laughs> Although I'll add, one, one of the interesting conversations that came up because of all these, this waste on it was that we have 4% of our weight is just empty bag, empty bags, right? right. So the, these are bags that are, they got one cup in them and, and they get, put into another big black bag and another big black bag. And so what we were able to do is take that information back to housekeeping and sort of make some changes. And so with our new paper towel composting effort, we're asking that they actually sort of push down the paper towels with a stick so that, you know, you can get more into those bags because of the cost of compostable bags. Great. And Nadia, can you talk a little bit about bag use on your campus? Yeah, so um, in our three bin stations, all three bins are lined, and so, but the difference is, is that the paper bin and the containers bin, those bags get ripped open when they're emptied into our tote, and if the bags are fairly, in fairly good condition, they get recycled, the soft plastic bags. And are, for when you expand your composting program, is that going to be a compostable bag or is that something that the contractor is going to deal with? Yeah, the contractor is going to deal with that. But from the paper towel standpoint, we'll probably do exactly what we do with the paper and containers bin whereby we'll line it with a regular clear plastic bag. And then when we empty it into the compost tote, we'll um, recycle the soft plastic bag. Okay, well, along those lines for um, talking about paper towel composting, um, have either of you, uh, either uh, group of presenters, had any issues with um, environmental health and safety and the idea of collecting paper towels from, from restrooms, either on a contamination side or regula regulatory side? And then for the folks from uh, Johnson County Community College, why? Um, are you not putting the paper towels in your in-vessel composter um, to address that issue? Um, for us, the reason I'll start with the first question or the, you know, the latter question is that um, we don't necessarily have the capacity for our in-vessel comp in composter the way that the, the mechanism works. Uh, the paper towels just wouldn't fit into our mixing system. So we're also going to have to move towards uh, using an outside vendor anyway for our newest post-consumer project that we're doing, post-consumer composting project we're doing this summer. And we definitely can't take any of that and put it into our system, which is going to be a lot of paper plates and cups that are compostable. Um, the, sorry, what was the second question, or the first question? It, it was about, oh, yeah. Uh, no, um, the folks that we're going to send it to uh, I've done this with some other organizations, and so they're they're happy to take it. But I'm sure, I mean, most people kind of start to think maybe there's an ick factor there, but we're also working as part of our pilot project to have two different cans in the restrooms, one specifying paper towels only and then another one uh, for trash. And we've been doing this pilot for the better of a month. About a month, and I, don't, I haven't heard of any real contamination issues so far. No. I mean, it's important, too, to have Sharpie containers in every every restroom that you're going to do this in. So, that, I mean, that, that was our biggest concern is needles. We don't want to see needles in any of these bins. Um, and so that's why it's important to have those needle containers in all your restrooms. Okay. Um, and Nadia, since you haven't implemented that, I didn't know if, if you've had any regulatory issues with the potential of collecting paper towels in restrooms. No, nope, not so far. So far, so good. Okay. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions uh, before we wrap this up. So um, at Johnson County Community College, uh, on your surplus property policy, uh, can you clarify a little bit, was that just an internal university policy that you were able to change, or, or were there state laws that you had to um, get around as well? And then... Um, can you also clarify, are all your sales now online through GovDeals, or do you still do um, some in-person auctions? 
Uh, we don't do any in-person auctions. It's all now on Gov deals. Correct. And, uh, and, and it's amazing the things that we sell and the where and the where the buyers come from. It, it's all really quite amazing. Yeah. Um, we, the other way we can sell things too is through, you know, larger vehicles. We we tend to sometimes do trade uh, value at, at a dealership and those kind of things. And we can also contract out larger items to sell those. But for the most part, small items are all sold through good deals. Yeah, in terms of the state law piece, I'd have to have legal in the room, but I um, I think there are some very broad uh, bits of state law involving public procurement in Kansas, but they did not impact this particular piece here. With uh, we just needed to make sure that we had some ability for the public uh, to have access to material that a public institution uh, was no longer going to be using if it had significant value. That, those are the those are sort of the key variables. And uh, the Gov deals uh, takes care of that particular piece of the, of the package. Okay, and then um, Nadia, I'll, I'll start with you on on this question. Um, you had mentioned a little bit that you, that uh, you hadn't heard a lot of feedback from students, but um, if you recruit students to kind of be interns in your program or advocates for your program, not necessarily specifically what you talked about today, but anywhere, what um, areas of, of degree programs do you have the most success in recruiting student workers or advocates? Um, well, yeah, that's all pretty much done through the sustainability office. Like, they have a huge network of student um, sort of green volunteers as well as staff volunteers. But from what I've seen, they've been mostly from the environmental studies program, some environmental psychology programs. Um, as well as uh, geography and biology students. Great, and same question for Jay and Michael. Uh, environmental science is typically the best place that we get our students from. Being a community college, um, you know, it's usually people who are trying to see if that's the direction they want to move forward in. We've had them from all over in, in other fields as well, the electrical program fields that we have for career tech. Um, Carpentry and and but mostly it's environmental science. Yeah, and I'll also say that uh, we reach out a lot of student services, and so we will occasionally have members of the student senate who will come and, and work with us, and then suddenly become converts. So it's uh, while Michael is correct that a lot of our actual hardcore folks do come from relatively predictable places. Um, that's we have some exceptions to that rule, but there's this general, I think, sort of vague sense out there among a lot of people on campus that these are the things that the campus should be doing, and uh, they will occasionally speak out even if they aren't necessarily members of our staff or working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they'll complain to their faculty or there'll be an email to somebody saying that recycling here isn't what it should be, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and I give another shout out to Eric, as Jay did earlier. He started in the culinary program and came over because there was a sort of a connection between making food and making compost. Mm -hmm. right. right. Well, um, thank you again so much to all our presenters uh, for uh, participating today. I do have some announcements to end the webinar on. Uh, as you can see on the slides, we have our upcoming Kirk webinars. Uh, the next one up is Recycling Collections on June 8th, 2017. Um, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. July 13th, Education and Outreach Programs. September 14th, Measuring Impact of Recycling and Waste Reduction. And November 9th, Food Organics, Waste Prevention and Recycling. You can always uh, access recordings from our recent programs uh, on our website, www.kirk3r.org, and also our historic archive of webinar programs. Um, so please check those out. I'd like to mention again our special bin opportunity partnership with Clean River Recycling. They have a new bin called the Flex E um, that can handle up to three streams with lid dividers. And right now there's an exclusive offer through Kirk for 25% off list price, free shipping on a full pallet, which I believe is 32 bins. Uh, there are four design packages available. The offer ends April 30th, and you can get full details and the promo code at um, it's kirk3r.org. Uh, so uh, 
Also some updates from AISHI. The Sustainability Awards call for entries will be accepted through May 12th. Um, and the annual Campus Sustainability Conference will be in San Antonio, Texas this year, October 15th through 18th. Early bird registration, um, I believe that means opens in May, and you can go to the website conference.aishi.org to get more information. We'd hope that you'd consider joining Kirk at AISHI. We will have, have our annual workshop um, prior to the conference. Uh, it's a pre-conference workshop on the Sunday before the regular conference starts. You can register through the AISHI conference website. We'll have presentations, roundtable discussions, networking, a campus tour, and more. Um, the program details are coming soon, but our partner, our host partner for that is Trinity University in San Antonio. A couple of other upcoming conferences you might be interested in, the Collegiate Sports Sustainability Summit will be at the University of Florida June 5th through 7th in Gainesville, Florida. Um, you can see the, the conference website listed there. The Resource Recycling Conference will be August 28th through 30th in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the conference website is also listed on the slide there. One more very important announcement. Um, if you have any interest in getting involved with Kirk leadership, uh, we are seeking new board members um, or nominations for new board members for our board of directors. Uh, this is a leadership opportunity um, and your opportunity to give voice to help advance recycling and sustainable materials management in higher education. Uh, the self-nomination process is open through April 17th, I believe, and for more information, you can look at our website. Again, that's wrong on the slide, but it's kirk3r.org, um, and uh, we encourage you to consider if you think you could add to our board of directors. Once again, I want to thank our webinar partners, Keep America Beautiful and AISHI, and all of our presenters. Um, and uh, hope that you will join us again for a future webinar. Following this webinar, you should receive a prompt to complete a quick survey. We encourage you to take a minute uh, to give us feedback on today's program. Again, we want to recognize those partners, Keep America Beautiful, for planning and logistics support, and AISHI for their promotional support. And once again, uh, thank you to our presenters, Nadia, Jay, and Michael. We hope to see you on the next program on June 8th. Thank you. Thank you.